Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the 2DCC webinar series. Today we have Dr. Chen Gong from the University of Maryland. He's going to be giving a talk on 2D ferroic materials and devices. Dr. Gong, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. Uh, thank you also for uh, Stephanie and uh, Ji Chang for the invitation. Uh, in the beginning, I give a little advertisement. I will actually visit Penn State. I think it's March 20th, so within like three weeks to to give a talk there as well. So probably will meet many of you. Welcome to join the colloquium there. Uh, but anyhow, I think there will be at least 50% or even more difference, different content in that talk. Uh, so don't worry about the overlapping content too much. Uh, today, I will talk about 2D ferroic uh, materials and devices. Uh, give a notice, this is for the NSF 2D CC Center's webinar. So probably it's for a little bit more broader audience, even though it's called 2D CC. But I know someone are not exactly on 2D. Sometimes they work on the bulk material of 2D, the 3D counterpart of 2D, or even other related stuff. Uh, so I will sometimes go slowly rather than it's a little bit different from a research talk. Uh, so in the beginning, let me introduce a little bit what are ferroic. Uh, uh, anyhow, I start with the uh, acknowledgement to a lot of collaborators, funding agencies, and student postdocs. Uh, we, of course, will have a lot of very good collaborators, but here I only list those whose results are included in this uh, slide. Uh, there are some other names, ongoing collaborators whose names are not there, so you know why. And also the research are primarily uh, here, in, including these slides, are primarily supported by uh, Defense, Department of Defense and NSF. Uh, so Department of Defense, including Air Force and other like Army Research Lab, North Uh Navy Air Warfare Center, Aircraft Division. And uh, results are primarily from here at the UMD, from primarily from uh, two postdocs, Dr. Wang and Dr. Xie, and the senior student, uh, Shen Chen Liang. So what are ferroic? Uh, ferroic mean many materials, it could be ferromagnet, anti-ferromagnet, ferroelectrics, anti-ferroelectrics, or other things like ferroelasticity. Uh, basically, when you see this word ferro, uh, it means when it has a permanent property, when you withdraw the external stimuli, the property is still there. Uh, here, as you can see, ferromagnet, when you apply a magnetic field, you can align the spin along one direction, or you apply a magnetic field along the other direction. Uh, so the spin will be aligned along the other direction. But when you withdraw the externally applied field, this alignment remains there. Uh, so that's ferromagnet. Ferroelectrics, uh, that uh, they have, you know, they have permanent electric dipole as shown by this ABO prof second structure. Uh, the B atom here is not exactly at the center, but off center. It could be up or down with respect to, to the center. So you can see a permanent electric dipole. You can use the electric field to polarize up or down, but when you withdraw the electric field, it remains there. So that's ferroelectrics. But there are other things, other ferroic, as I mentioned. But here we primarily talk about ferromagnets and ferroelectrics. Um, so both two are very important with interesting physical properties, but also uh, they lay foundation for a critical set of non-volatile memory, uh, like uh, magnet tunnel junction. Uh, many of you know very well. Right now, of course, in your laptop top, it's not data is not stored by Montana Junction, but in a large uh, data center, they still use this. And in my uh, undergraduate study, I, like over uh, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, when I began to use computer, I always, you know, this computer is slow. And you always see uh, here the noise. Uh, actually, sometimes it's moving the tip to reading the data. And I believe that time the data are all based on such a magnet tunnel junction. Basically, you can see a tri-layer structure. You have two layers of ferromagnet. Uh, this horizontal line uh, arrows represent the spin orientation of the two magnet layers. When they are aligned along the same direction, or when they are aligned along the opposite direction, they show different resistance. 
One is lower resistance, one is higher resistance. So, so you see this tunneling magnetic resistance effect, and this gives you the binary data, data zero and data one for logic uh, 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 operations. So ferro, ferro electric tunnel junction, you also have such a, a novel tile memory. Uh, basically, you have two normal metals, but they are different. And then separated by a thin ferroic layer, ferroelectric layer. When you polarize the ferroelectric up or down, and you can see the different tunneling resistance. That's called the tunneling electro resistance. So you can see both of them are uh, both ferromagnet and ferroelectric laser foundation for two different but of equally uh, important uh, non volatile memories. So I will start with 2D magnet. And the ma majority of this talk are on magnet. And later on, we'll move to ferroelectrics. You will see why we move there, because we will use ferroelectric to control the magnet. That's a so-called multi-ferroics. But I don't think I have time to extend the, the content on fer 2D ferro effect to the same degree as on 2D magnet. So we will focus on 2D magnet first and uh, talk a little bit about 2D ferroelectrics. So as I said, many of the audience may not be exactly in this field or may not be in the field of 2D ferroic or 2D fer magnet. I will give a little bit uh, you know, detailed background. Regarding magnets, we know they have a lot of applications. Uh, basically, they can interact with electrons and they even bend the electrons' trajectories. They can also be involved in a lot of electrical mechanical control system. You push a button, the current flows, and the generating magnetic field, and then interacting with a permanent magnet to cause a motion. This kind of electromechanic control system is everywhere. At least the 30 parts are in your v electric vehicle, or data storage, or synchrotron, like a, depending on, based on the magnetic field bending of electron trajectory, and then further emitting the X-ray. But anyhow, there are many applications. When it goes to 2D, of course, that will be something very interesting. Uh, sounds like this magnet, magnetism is um, an old topic, but actually it, it has been there for, 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 for a long while, even before we noticed them. So you know those animals know how to, how to navigate between two different places far away uh, from each other, sometimes thousands of miles away. Those birds, fish, insects, they all know how to navigate, but uh, we know there is no GPS. So sometimes you, you will see DAPA have a call called biologically inspired navigation. Basically, if you know GPS signal, how we can learn from those animals how to navigate. Uh, so you can see they give some examples and at least two of, the, of them are based on magnetism or magnetic properties. Uh, so we, we are still not uh, you know, fully exploring the physics and applications of magnets, especially in recent years when 2D magnets emerge. If someone are wondering what's the difference between 2D layered magnets and the tr traditional magnets, you can see actually okay, 2D layered materials are like this. Even using scotch tape, you can get easily several or tens of micrometer size. Sometimes with some students are capable or some, some processing are specially designed, you can even get 100 micrometer or larger one. But by CVD, you can get even wafer scale or even larger one, uh, sometimes single crystalline 2D materials. But if you look at the traditional magnetic film, for example, if you use MBE to grow a single la layer iron on a substrate, for example, tung 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 tungsten, and nominally it's one layer or two layer, or sometimes you can even from paper see 1.3 layer or 1.5 molar layer. So that means this layer number is an average layer number. If you look into the detail, you will find actually it's a nucleation-based growth. There are many islands. Each island, within each island, could be uniform in terms of thickness and also single crystalline. But you have tons of such nano island. Each island on the size of just like tens of nanometer. So certainly you can see it's different from 2D uh, layered vanavas materials. And also this MB growth magnetic thin film strongly coupled with the substrate. So their properties are also altered. That's why, why in many different papers, you will see nominally the same materials. They show sometimes hundreds of degree TC difference. 
Uh, so you can see if we can have the magnetic order, ferromagnetism especially, into the layered material, you will have certainly different application prospect and even probably new physics. So in early days, uh, uh, even since the discovery of graphene, many efforts are there trying to find uh, to the long range magnetic order. So there are three types of main effort. One is defect engineering. Basically in graphene, polysulfide, or whatever non-magnetic 2D materials, you can either add, add some elements on the 2D crystal or take away some atoms. So you add something or remove something. You can always easily create spin moment, but they are local. It's very hard to align them. So far, I don't think there is a consensus in the successful development of long range order by this method. The other method is very uh, smart, uh, basically universally effective. Uh, uh, if you allow me to see like this, you put a non-magnetic 2D material like graphene with a magnetic material with a clean interface. Uh, so then you will see the interfacial wave function overlap between the two material while spin polarized uh, graphene or other non-magnetic 2D material. But you can see this is an extrinsic effect uh, certainly, the exchange interaction is not simply established because of the pi electron in carbon, but they are mediated by substrate. And meanwhile, of course, uh, in terms of device application, you probably need to carry the whole stack uh, to, to maintain the magnetic property in the, uh, the, the, the so-called uh, uh, 2D uh, uh, material magnet. But here is certainly not an a intrinsic 2D magnet. Third one is band structure engineering. I think this is a very uh, exquisite way. As long as in a material you can find a flat band and then there will be a large density of state within a very narrow energy window, then likely you can satisfy the stoner instability and causing the ferromagnetic phase change. So uh, in some materials, people, you know, especially based on uh, theoretical calculation, People begin to find, for example, in bilayer graphene, when you apply electric field, you can create a small gap, and then you have a flat band on the band, band edge, or highly p type doped gallium sunlight. But anyhow, either way, you can see it's very hard in experiment. You need to find such a material and then drive or park your Fermi level at that band edge, at that position. So in early days, I did not see success, but especially in recent years with in trilayer graphing, interfacing with high and bond I tried uh, magic angle twisted by layer graphing in many such system, we saw the uh, proved ferromagnetism. So yeah, so in early days, what I did uh, uh, based on uh, uh, intrinsic magnetic crystal, uh, I will quickly show this result and meanwhile uh, show the methodology we use. Normally it's different from uh, those researchers uh, in the traditional thin film field or bulk, uh, bulk material field. So as you can see, such a material, uh, it also have a bulk counterpart on the order of several millimeter uh, uh, in size. And then we can exfoliate them down to few layers. Like, as you can see, it's a layered material. It's not magnetic doped. Um, by the vast material, but the magnetic element is part of the crystal, and then we can exfoliate them. So here is a simple uh, illustration for those people who are not in 2D field. We usually start with a wafer and cut it into pieces of chips and then exfoliate the flake. So you can imagine hundreds of different flakes on this chip. But if you only compare this one flake with the substrate, you will find the flake is micrometer size, and nanometer thickness. And the chip is a millimeter size and half millimeter in terms of thickness. You simply calculate, do a calculation, you will find actually the volume difference has like 10 to 12 orders magnitude difference. So if you put such a chip in the VSM for ma magnetic hysteresis loop measurement, even though you see uh, some tiny hysteresis loop window opening, it's very hard to believe the signal is really just from this flake rather than from other flake, other edge, or even the substrate and or interface. So we need some area selective method 
uh, it's better to be surface sensitive to just pick up the signal from that flake. So the the methodology uh, I use is called magnetic optical effect. And then we also use the magnetic circular dichroism. I will quickly explain this methodology. As you can see, if the material is a magnetic thin film or 2D magnet, you have order the spin. And then when you shine the linear polarized light, the linear polarization represented by this line with double arrow. So the electric field of this light just uh, is uh, vibrate, is, uh, is along this direction. And then due to this orbital and spin, spin orbital coupling, you will have a rotation when the reflected light is examined. You know, the polarization of this light will have a rotation. And then by keep track of this core rotation, you can keep track of the magnetic signal as a dependence, for example, on the thickness of sample, on the temperature, on the magnetic field. So if you consider the other way, this light, linear polarized light, is the superposition of left and the right circle of polarized light. So if this left and right circle of polarized light, upon reflection, they have a phase difference, then you will cause a curl rotation. If they have different reflectance, then you will have the so-called magnetic circular dichroism. That means you will not only have a rotation, but this will not be a perfect linear light, it will become elliptical. So in old days, in like 30 years in 1990s, when smoke becomes popular, uh, that time some literature you can see it called smoke, surface magneto optical curl effect. Anyhow, sometimes people check the curl rotation. Sometimes people check the so-called ellipticity. But anyhow, you know, right? One is based on the phase difference between the two circular polarized light upon reflection. The other one is based on the reflectance difference of the two circular polarized light. Either way, you can use them to characterize the magnetic property. So this is air, area selective surface sensitive method. And this is the optical image of the two and three layer Chromium germanium telluride, I exfoliated before on silicon oxide, silicon chip. And when we put it in a crust diet and cool it down, you can see at low temperature, like around four Kelvin, you can see a clear emergence of curl rotation angle. But at 40K, at a little elevated temperature, the two layer sample, uh, the curl rotation signal is gone. But three layer is still there, quite robust. So that indicates a strong thickness dependent TC. And this is also one reason why it's so hard to observe to the magnet in early days, because you can see it, 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 they have a reduced TC. And meanwhile, of course, the small volume sample will give limited number of limited uh, strength of signal. Anyhow, we do a systematic thickness dependent, temperature dependent core rotation. And then you can extract the onset of the core rotation angle and define them as a TC. So you can see a thickness dependent TC. This clearly show a dimensionality effect. So when thin sample becomes thinner, the TC is reduced compared with their 3D counterpart. So this directly reveal the strong thermal fluctuation into the system. Uh, the renormalized spin waves calculation uh, confirmed this trend. Uh, so this is temperature dependent data. And the other evidence we usually need to prove the ferromagnetism is the magnetic hysteresis loop. You can see the hysteresis loop uh, is pretty much like its bulk counterpart. It's a small loop, but it's still a loop. So the question is whether you have remnants or not. So you can see when I withdraw the field, magnetic field from positive or from negative, there is non-zero remnants and they are opposite in sign. So again, this confirmed this is a 2D ferromagnet. Uh, why the remnant is small? Simply because the domain size is small, usually on the order of tens of nanometer. But this laser spot for this measurement is micrometer size. So you will always measure the night result, which is an ensemble of uh, tens of hundreds of domains. So that's why you have reduced magnetization. But if you have a fine resolution, like based on electron beam, go into that tens of nanometer size, I believe you will get a square perfect square shape hysteresis loop. So hysteresis loop is not a, a intrinsic property of material. So that's why this lecture, the, in, this, in this course, in this semester, I also taught a course at UMD. I always emphasize that if, if you ask what's a hysteresis loop of material, you need to be very careful. 
you need to be asking them what's the sample size, what's what's the detection method, and what's the temperature you measure. So basically, a Jesus loop is not like DC; it's a fixed or set uh, uh, physical property of a material. So anyhow, uh, based on temperature, magnetic field, dependent data, you we confirm this is a two D ferromagnet. This add a a a, a new uh, type of uh, materials into the existing large family of 2D materials. And uh, this is this is exciting because when you combine 2D magnet with others, you will see a lot of uh, even newer things. So when new materials are invented or discovered, uh, many, many different aspects can be uh, pursued. And here I will show how to el efficiently electric control 2D magnets. Normally in the field of 2D materials, uh, we, we, in papers you will see that there, there are many such claims. Uh, it's atomic thing, so it's very easy to control. On the one hand, it's correct, but sometimes when you calculate them quantitatively, you find the energy uh, cost or the final effect of the control is not that you know encouraging. It's not, sometimes it costs a lot of energy, sometimes the controlling effect is limited. So in terms of electric control, here we were just a limit to talk about uh, voltage control uh, rather than current control. Uh, so when we use voltage control, normally, okay, we use electric field to control or electrostatic doping to control. That depends on where you put, apply your voltage, right? So when we use voltage uh, to electric field to control, you know, the externally applied electric field is several orders magnitude weaker than the inherent crystal field. So this is sounds like fractional, uh, cannot cause a very sizable effect, right? The, on the other hand, if you use silicon oxide as a dielectric layer to achieve the so-called electrostatic doping control, the doping level can only go like to 10 to 13 electrons per centimeter square. But you know each surface have per centimeter square, you have 10 to 15 atoms. So basically for each surface atom, you modulate the electron density up to 0.01 electron per atom. So it's also fractional. Uh, we did not talk about ionic control here. It's a little bit complicated and also still some a lot of debates because the ions can easily intercalate in the material and even strongly bond and cause the structure distortion or chemical, new chemical substances. So we just talk about these two. As you can see, electric field control or electrostatic doping control sounds like not that energy efficient from the back of envelope calculation. So here, I will first show three parts of theoretical work and then move on our experimental work. When we talk about control, we really hope to, that, to see that we use a small energy input, for example, small voltage. And we can control the property to a very large degree. So the output side. So the first part of work, I will emphasize input. Second part, I will emphasize output, controlling effect. The third part, I will combine them, use the small input to achieve a large control effect. So how to use a small voltage control? Uh, we use the idea that existed in the multifaroid community. Basically, if you have a Van der header structure here, the 2D magnet is chromium germanium tolerite. The 2D ferroelectric is indium selenite. And the DFD calculation shows that if you polarize the ferrolite indium selenide polarizing up or down in figure A and B, the calculated magnetic anisotropy of CGT chrome gem telluride is in plane and out of plane as illustrated in A and B. So you can see a ferroelectric control of the magnetic anisotropy of 2D CGT. This is very interesting. Given you have a ferroelectric material, it can allow you to use a small voltage, just the coercive voltage to flip the ferroelectric polarization. That means the ions are moved. Once ions are moved, of course, it can cause substantial effect in the magnetic property. It's not like just the electrostatic doping or electrical field. Now ions are moved, and then they, of course, will bond to, to the magnet and cause strong effect. Such an interfacial effect is strong in many systems. In, in this review paper, I mentioned that if you 2D, couple 2D material with other, actually the magnetic property can be changed by many mechanisms. 
Here, we will not go into that level of detail to analyze each mechanism, but I will use three experiment work we did to impress you how such a uh, interfacial effect could change the magnet property. So this figure shows that if we have a 2D ion germanium telluride, it's not that 2D, it's eight layer. But when you put just the one layer, molybdenum, the molybdenum disulfide, just the one layer, you can see uh, made at 100 K, the coercivity change about close to 200 oyster. Uh, please keep in mind the coercivity I made here is from the all the eight layer numbers. So I believe if you can zoom in to just see the interfacial FGT layer, probably the coercivity change could be even larger. But anyhow, so you can see just the one layer is enough to change the eight layer samples coercivity. Coercivity is a direct reflection of magnetic anisotropy. So certainly here, uh, there is a strong interfacial effect. The reason is simple. Moly is a heavy element. It causes the strong, the strong spin of the coupling arising from moly actually will uh, change the magnetocrystalline anisotropy of the neighboring FGT. The other example, also very simple. My student just put two FGT ion germanium telluride together. Exfoliate one, exfoliate another one, put them together, and they find the two coercivity. Sometimes probably even more if you look into detail. But anyhow, if you had two one make two jump, so two coercivity, one coercivity smaller, one larger. But this smaller one and larger one differ from any of the original FGT. If you look at FGT coercivity here and here, you find these two differ from the two coercivity in the heterostructure region. So that means these two, two layers interact with each other and causing a change in coercivity, but they are not merging into one thicker FGT, which should show only one coercivity. So again, this is to highlight how the interfacial interaction is critical for the magnetic property. The third one is even exotic. I have a 2D anti-ferromagnetic layered material, iron phosphor sulfide. And I put one layer and two layer and three layer tungsten sulfide, which is non-magnetic. And I use a circularly polarized white light and see the absorption deep. So that prove the spin polarized band gap of tungsten sulfide. Initially, they are identical, so they, there's no difference between the left and right circular polarizer absorption deep. There's no difference between spin up and spin down, band gap in tungsten sulfide. And when tungsten sulfide is put on iron phosphor sulfide, which is anti-ferromagnetic material, naively speaking, we should expect that it's just like on silicon oxide. When you change the magnetic field, you should just see a normal Zeeman effect. So um, when tungsten sulfide to valley and you have four ball magnetic difference, you should see a 0 0.2 mEV per tesla uh, magnetic field dependent Zeeman splitting. And indeed, when we put the one layer tungsten sulfide on silicon oxide or on iron phosphor sulfide, it's a linear curve about 0 0.2 mEV per tesla. But when I put two layer and three layer on iron phosphor sulfide, you can see the slope is enhanced by an order of magnitude compared with uh, tungsten sulfide on silicon oxide. And also there is a saturation region at about three tesla. So it indicates, it strongly suggests there may be some net magnetization formed at the uh, interfacial layer. So that means the tungsten sulfide convert the surface layer of iron phosphor sulfide to, you know, kind of like a ferromagnet, you know, create some net magnetization. So anyhow, these three examples to show interfacial effect can largely change the magnetic property. And now go back, if we have a ferroelectric on to the magnet, and now you will certainly change the magnetic property. And then this change is ferroelectric polarization dependent. So anyhow, this part of work is to show how we use a ferroelectric to control 2D mag to allow you to use a small voltage control. 
As I said, the second part that we focus on the controlling effect, how large, how largely the property we can control. You know, I got, you know, I focus on this idea. Can we control between 0% spin polarization and the 100% spin polarization? So this is a half metallic metallic concept. If you have a 2D ferromagnet, have another 2D ferromagnet put in this way. Either you put them together in this way, or they are intrinsically exchange coupled by anti-ferromagnetic interlayer coupling. Anyhow, you have such an A-type anti-ferromagnet. If you look at the one layer alone, it's ferromagnet, spin up and spin down band are split. If you look at the other layer alone, again, they are ferromagnet. But if you look at them, them together, they are anti-ferromagnet, anti so with zero uh, magnetization. Now, if you apply an electric field across these two layers, you can see the electrostatic energy on the two layers are different. So they will push down one layer's energy band and lift up the energy band of the other layer relatively. So finally, you will have the spin. You will have one band merge, the other band remaining open. So. Now the Fermi level across one spin polarized band, you have 100% spin polarized carriers for transport. And then you have another spin polarized band as an insulator. So for in, uh, so basically you can see here, it's still anti-ferromagnet, but spin up, spin down band are split. So you have a half metal. And then this 100% spin polarization is great for uh, spin FET. So you can build such a device, A-type antiferromagnet, use a voltage to create half metallicity, turn on and turn off the half metallicity, or you use a voltage positive or negative voltage to create to push spin up or spin down electron to the Fermi level. So you like transistor, you can switch, you can reverse the polarization. Transistor is reversal between electron and hole, but here is a reversal between spin up and spin down electron. So the third part, I will go very quickly because this is a combination of the first two ideas. You use ferroelectric to control a type anti-ferromagnet. Again, you have a similar band alignment as I just showed in the second part of work, a ferroelectric polarizing dependent band alignment. You can push the spin up or spin down band to the Fermi level. So to realize half metal, in the end, you can build such a multi-ferroic uh, field effect transistor. So you have ferroelectric, to con allow you to use, allow you to use small voltage, you have the 100% spin polarization arising from half metallicity. So this is the logic through these three ideas. One is ferroelectric control, focusing on the small voltage input. One is half metallicity, focusing on the maximize the controlling effect. Then the third part is a combination of the two. So, uh, uh, in a UMD. I began to impl implement this idea. You can see this is experiment work. We exfoliated the 2D chromium germanium telluride on silicon oxide silicon chip. And then we deposit uh, polymer ferroelectric by spin coating. And then we deposit ITO as a transparent electrode on top. And locally, you can use chromium gold as a top electrode. So you can apply electric field vertically to flip the polarization. And you can meanwhile use a laser to probe the property change. So you can see uh, figure B, later on I will revisit. When you polarize the ferropolarization in figure B and C, the interfacial atoms are different. Figure B, you have fluorine and hydrogen atom directly bonding to the, to the uh, magnet. But in figure C, only fluorine directly bonding to CGT. So that's what I said. Polarization dependent interfacial bonding or polarization dependent interfacial crystal field. Then that, that of course will change all the magnet property, including the magnetocrystalline anisotropy uh, observed by coercivity change. So you can see this is an interfacial effect, should be more prominent for 2D rather than 3D sample. So for the two layer and eight layer sample, we'll do a comparison. For the eight layer sample, when we apply positive field, negative field, you almost see nothing changed. And for the thinner sample, two layer sample, you can see a hysteresis loop opened and closed. If you keep track of this voltage 
when you apply different voltage, corresponding different electric field. Voltage dependent remnants or voltage dependent coercivity, you actually can get this curve. So it's a historical dependence, uh, non volatile effect. This is certainly a hallmark feature of the ferroelectrics. It's not a pure electric field control or electrostatic doping control, which is not which is, which is volatile. Here is non volatile and allow you to only use five volts. Keep it, pay attention to the x axis. We write V F E. It means effective voltage. Look at this device. The voltage we apply mostly are wasted through the silicon oxide, and only a small portion is effectively applied on the hydrostructure. So this is serious capacitor model. So that's why when we apply a big voltage in experiment, we extract the effective voltage on the heterostructure. And later on, I will prove this is true. So we re-modify the device. As you can see in this one, figure C shows, we now use a bottom graphing electrode. And between bottom graphing electrode and top ITO electrode, you have the heterostructure. And then, you did not waste, you are not wasted the voltage across silicon oxide if you apply the voltage, bottom voltage through uh, uh, bottom electrode silicon. So anyhow, now you, you can really just uh, use a small voltage to flip the ferrite polarization and see the magnetic property change. As you can see, we can use just uh, five volts to flip the ferrite polarization and see the non-volatile control of the hysteresis loop. And as I said, here the mechanism is based on the ferro polarization dependent interfacial crystal field. Normally in multiferroic community, people call it compensate multiferroic. It's either layer by layer ferroelectric ferromagnet or the synthesized alloy, a lot of particles, magnetic particles and ferroic particles mixed together. But anyhow, you have two phase. And normally, the, due to the piezoelectric effect of the ferroelectric component, they will cause a strain. And the strain will further, of course, strain the magnetic component. Because between the ferroelectric and the ferromagnet, you usually have a strong covalent bonding. But here is a layered system. Uh, the, the, the strain is hardly to be transferred to different layers. So as you can see, this Rama spectrum of this struck hydrostructure will apply different voltage. Uh, at least in the detection limit, I did not see, we did not see the observable uh, strain in the 2D magnet. And doping is also not a mechanism here, is not a main mechanism here. You can see here, polymer ferroelectric is a dielectric system with a band gap. CGT is also a 2D magnetic insulator gap system. Unless they have a broken gap alignment, they have you know one band, one valence band top is even higher than the other layers conduction band uh, minimum. Then you will have a sizable electron transfer. Otherwise, you will just have a negligible charge transfer. And the DFT calculation also confirmed this. This is easy to understand. So here in this system is just the primarily the ferroelectric polarization dependent interfacial crystal field. So. After looking at those ferroelectric polarization, uh, ferroelectric control of 2D magnet, well, slightly change your gear to talk about 2D layered ferroelectrics. Uh, there are several popular 2D ferroelectric here. I just want to talk about copper indium phosphor sulfide. In figure A, you can see the copper represented by that uh, red ball can be moved down and moved up uh, corresponding to different polarizations. And you can see this is a ferroelectric tunnel junction. As I showed before, you use two different metals. Here, one is 3D metal, chromium. The other one is 2D metal, graphene. And then separated by just a few layers, CIPS, copper, indium, phosphor, sulfide layers. And when you flip the polarization, and inherent dipole, of course, is within the CIPS, and then they will change the tunneling barrier. Uh, from one electrode to the other. So this will change the resistance dramatically. Uh, TMR 
when you change the magnetic layers in magnetic tunnel junction, you can only change the resistance slightly. So that's why TMR probably usually are ten percent up to 100, 200 percent. It, it's just uh, you know uh, some change of resistance. Uh, you can see two hundred percent is just uh, two times. But here you can change the resistance by several orders of magnitude easily. Even you will see a billion times. So this is a record high performance uh, for FDG achieved in our lab. When we build this chromium CIPS graphene FDG, we achieved 10 to nine uh, on off ratio. And when we just, just put one layer of molysulfide in between the chromium CIPS and graphene here, it further enhance the tunnel electro resistance to 10 to 10 five times 10 to 10 at room temperature. And it's worth to mention that in traditional FTGA field, the FTGA is based, built based on oxide ferroelectrics. And the best on-off ratio at room temperature is just a 10 to six. So here is three to four order magnitude enhance, enhancement. The, I think there are three major enabling physics that cause this record high on off ratio. First, the CIPS has very minor amount, you know, trivial amount of defect compared with the oxide zinc layers, which have a lot of defect vacancies, you know. So the band gap of CIPS is clean. So you don't have those lot of defect state in the band gap to cause the indirect tunneling. So this is one thing. The second one is, as I said, FDGA fundamentally depends on the two asymmetric, two unidentical electrodes. But in traditional FDGA, you just use two different 3D metals. Here, we use 3D metal chromium and 2D metal graphene. So such an electrode asymmetry is very pro prominent. So this is the second reason, electrode asymmetry. The first one is, clean band gap, so no indirect tunneling. The third one is, you can see FTGA is based on the ferroelectric modulation of band alignment between the three layers. So you can see here in CIPS graphing interface, no Fermi level pinning, but traditionally you have oxide, you have metal, metal semiconductor or metal gap system, you always have the metal induced gap state and the related Fermi level pinning, no matter it's of hard, Fermi level pinning or partial Fermi level pinning, you have a Fermi level pinning. So that one will wake, weaken or even nullify the ferro like control of the band alignment. But in CIPS graphing interface, you don't have such an issue. I did not see at the chromium graphing a CIPS interface, you don't have the issue. You should have some type of Fermi level team pinning there, but you don't have the Fermi level pinning on the other side of the interface. So probably because of the three reasons, we, we get 10 to 10 on operation. And also very interestingly, as a physicist, we can see actually if you put just a one layer semiconductor gap system, you can tune, you know, find control the electron quantum tunneling pathway through such a multi-layer system. So that this demonstrates you can through the do the layer by layer engineering of the quantum tunneling pathway uh, in FTG, in Van Vars FTG. So I will quickly summarize uh, what I just talked about. First, I reviewed uh, uh, early work of experiment discovery of the 2D magnet. And that's before I joined UMD. Uh, later on, I show three part of experiment theoretical work uh, uh, focusing on uh, how to use small voltage to control the magnet and how to realize, uh, maximize the controlling effect and plus Finally, one experiment work shows the non-volatile small voltage, just a five volts, uh, non-volatile uh, electric control, ferro electric control of 2D magnet. And that's a multi effect, which depends on the, which relies on the ferro electric polarization dependent interfacial crystal field. Uh, finally, I talk about a uh, 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 device work based on 2D, Ferro Van der Waals ferroelectric materials. 
and we build such a uh, ferro tunnel junction due to the three enabling physics I just reviewed, uh, we achieved the record high on of ratio 10 to 10 at room temperature. Four orders of magnitude higher than the best on off ratio in the traditional oxide ferroelectric based FTG. So in the end, I will, uh, uh, you know, just one slide, I think, uh, uh, those kind of ferroid materials are certainly category of functional quantum materials. And meanwhile, they are directly a critical component, as I mentioned in the beginning, critical component for many uh, major non-volatile memories for microelectronic chips. So you can see this, I think these 2D ferroic materials and devices are at the intersection uh, of these two uh, hot topics right now, uh, quantum information science and uh, microelectronic and chips and science act. Uh, so in the end, I will acknowledge the funding agency again and my collaborators as I highlighted, only those whose results are presented here in my postdoc, uh, changing and postdoc, uh, T share working on the uh, ferroelectronic junction. T was uh, actually a student working on this uh, right now, just a turn to be a postdoc. And then San uh, uh effort uh, on the ferro control of 2D magnets, uh, that nature electronic work. So in the end, I also want to do two quick advertisements. The one is I said before, I will visit Penn State on March 20th to give a talk. And the other one is I have openings for postal students. So yeah, for any questions or applications, well, please send me an email. I'm happy to talk. Okay, for this talk, yeah, I, I am happy to take on questions. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gong, please. Good. Okay, any questions online from those listening in? Um, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask right away. Okay, I'm not hearing any yet. Anybody on site here have a question? <clears throat> Okay, Nick, go ahead. So earlier in your work, you presented some, uh, I think it was molysulfide on one of your systems and how the spin orbit coupling enhances the, uh, the magnetic hysteresis or something like that. Uh, what would you expect would happen if you replace, say, molysulfide with, say, tungsten selenide, which has a much larger spin orbit coupling? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. The question is about if I replace molysulfide with other TMD, like tungsten sulfide, of tungsten selenide, those things, uh, whether a large spin of the coupling will cause uh, some something similar or different. Uh, yeah, uh, it will, uh, but spin of the coupling is a very uh, complicated phenomenon. So certainly this uh, tungsten will have, a, is a heavier element or give stronger SOC. But whether this SOC will promote outplant anisotropy or implant anisotropy, that really depends on the. Of course, when orbital spin optical coupling is involved, uh, it's not so precise to uh, further simply say the orbital concept. But many times in calculation, try to when they try to analyze which. Uh, and such a, you know, and such outplant and or implant and is enhanced. We certainly uh, still use the orbital's language. And so now, because of the orbital magnetic moment difference or between spin optical coupling difference have an orbital de dependence, then they will cause the enhanced outplant or implant and therapy. So here, certainly, tungsten have a higher, so you know, stronger SOC, but whether they will enhance implant or enhance outplant and therapy more. That's a very, I mean, that's case by case. I, I don't think we can easily just give, give a conclusion, but certainly there will be some strong effect. And yeah, that's my view, yeah. Anyone else here on site? Questions? Do you have a follow up, Nick? No, I don't. Yeah. Anyone online, last chance. <clears throat> Oh, 
Okay, Dr. Gong, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on March 20th. Um, and if you'd like to see the 2DCC while you're here on site, just go ahead and email us separately. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Gabby. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, I'll also look forward to visit and see you there. Bye. Have a good day.